and I coordinate Farming for Nature. Farming for Nature was set up to inspire and encourage farmers that farm or wish to farm more for nature. One of the ways we do this is we find exemplary farmers each, uh, each year through our National Farming for Nature Ambassador Awards. And these farmers um, are able to share the practical management they do on their farm for nature. This Q&A session is a great way to learn from these farmers and to be able to ask and share your experiences and have your questions for the farmer as well. So it's the second last of our Q&A for the season. Um, so we have just one more after this and then we'll be stopping for a few months. Uh, but I would like to kickstart the event by I'll be asking our guest speaker a couple of questions and then you have a chat box on your black banner. Uh, so feel free to ask any questions that you want. And what we'll do is I'll facilitate the questions. I'll ask the speaker the questions. If you missed any of our previous sessions, um, they're up on our YouTube channel. Feel free to listen to them. You can download them and listen to them in your tractor or when you're working or whatever out in the fields. So, um, and feel free to share them with anyone that you think might be interested in any of them. So onto tonight's session. We're delighted to have Farming for Nature Ambassador Graham Harris join us. Graham is an organic and sheep, uh, organic sheep and tillage farmer from County Clare. Uh, sorry, he's not from County Clare at all. He's from County Kildare. Uh, Graham, welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. Yep, thanks very much. Uh, it's good to be here talking to everyone. Great. Uh, Graham, you run a 170 acre farm with uh, sheep and tillage. Can you describe your farm and your farming system to us? Yeah, OK. Um, it's a 170 acre farm situated in Kildare. It's, it's, it's predominantly good land. There's only a very small amount of it that isn't, uh, it isn't workable. Um, we're growing um, barley, um, barley pea, oats, uh, wheat bean, um, and we have kind of a fertility building lays then for the sheep. So we've about 130 yews that lamb down about the 1st of March, and then the, it's, it's all spring cropping at the moment. So that's, that's sort of what we're at um year to year so it's been fairly steady at that now for the last three or four years now so it's, it's a nice balance between the the stock and the and the tillage Great. and what's your own journey into this farm or farming so i suppose well i, I grew up on the farm here and uh, it was a conventional farm um i suppose it was probably something i didn't realize but my, my dad had kind of farmed it relatively sympathetically as it was something that probably escaped my attention um there were certain practices that were were quite sympathetic to nature, and it was probably a core belief of his. But it was, I was young at the time, and you suppose you don't sort of pick up on these things. So, um, in two thousand three, um, my father passed away, and I took over the farm, and I started out my own my own journey into farming. So he had been um, finishing beef, uh, beef cattle, uh, growing crops, and he had sheep. Um, I didn't really want to continue on with the with the beef enterprise, so I focused on tillage and sheep so um i was conventional farm and that was what i was happy with at the time so um the focus was on production and and driving productivity i suppose it's what it's all you ever heard of when you went out to any any walks or you open a journal it's all about producing more so i looked at we started cutting hedges back further um the hedges would have been quite overgrown here so i suppose walk at the farm with people and you'd be looking around you'd be there thinking well just, just, just land there. You could, you could use like you know you're losing a meter here and two meters there with hedge grow. So um, we started looking at the hedges. The hedges started getting cut back, so they got trimmed back, and then we were trying to drive productivity in the the tillage uh, enterprise. So um, looking at my timings, my timings were probably off when I started off. I was much bit, maybe a bit, bit naive, and I wasn't hitting my timings right. So I started hitting the timings better with the with the spray programs. And I was getting good success out of my, my tillage ground and we were, we were increasing yields every year um, and things were going in the right direction. But I suppose the thing I noticed was every year it was a little bit more fertilizer. So where you started off, you, you would have been getting recommendations to two and a half bags, that had gone to 2.75 to three bags. It just kept increasing. My yields were increasing at the same time. So <clears throat> that was fine. But as I looked at it, um, I saw it as unsustainable. So you were getting big yields off your farm, but you were asking too much of your land and you were driving it too hard. In, in my, I, I don't think it could have kept going at that level. So 
you know, some of the winter barley fields were, were producing over four tons of winter barley and I was taking 15 bales to the acre off as well. So it was paying, it was, um, it was going well, but I just I was starting to feel uncomfortable with what I was asking the land to do. So around that time, I, um, I came across a guy doing a soils course called uh, David Wallace. And my brother had been uh, knocking around with him for years and he, uh, he talked to him before. So when he was doing the soils course, I, so I said, right, I'll go do this. And it was when I went to that, it really, it really just kind of changed things for me. So then I started thinking less from the ground up and more about what was underneath the soil and how the farm was working. And that really changed how I wanted to farm. So uh, that was probably with 2018, I think. Um, so uh, the other thing that was happening was uh, not to run the conferences, the biofarm conferences, and I was going to see them. So a combination of that and the soils course kind of joined in together. And I started ch changing the way I thought about the farm. And then in 2019, they opened the, um, the organic farming scheme, opened up again, and they were quite keen on tillage farmers coming in. So I suppose what I was afraid of was I was afraid I was going to fall between two stools. That <clears throat> if I'd fallen, if I'd lost my faith in the conventional agricultural system, and I didn't want to be spreading all the fertilizer, I didn't want to be spraying some of the sprays, that where was I or what was I? So when the organic scheme came along, it gave me, um, it, it sort of helped me uh, to transition. There was a payment there and it meant that it was very clear cut, I suppose, that I was going to stop everything. And it, it just came along at the perfect time. And uh, my head was in the right space where I wanted to make that change. So it was a very easy change to make because it, uh, it was stuff I wanted to leave behind. And we started then the road to conversion, two years conversion into organics. And I'm just, I'm really happy with the farm is, is, is from there. So um, stop cutting hedges, and starting into rotations, fertility building lays and stuff like that. And yeah, that's... So just on a simple level, because I was going to ask you, <coughs> sorry, I have a tickle in my a cough. Um, <clears throat> you were saying it's easy to convert. What changes did you see on your land straight away? Well, I suppose it was my mindset that was changed already. So it wasn't necessarily, uh, the conversion's easy if you want to do it, I suppose. Like, so it was stuff I wanted to do and wanted to leave behind. So um. I, I, my head is in the right space to to have to deal if there was certain weeds that were going to be present on the farm. I suppose it's, it's hard to switch from a, a pristine, clean crop where you control every single thing in the field. You say nothing's growing but this barley or nothing's growing but this wheat and you tolerate nothing. Whereas you totally change that. Now I sow crops and there's a certain level of weed in the in the weeds and plants in the in the understory of the crop. Once nothing's out of balance or nothing's interfering with my production, it's it's all adding it's all benefit uh, in my view so so you don't have to manage the weeds within the crops i don't at the moment you just never know what's down the road for you um with weeds and with balance in the land if the soil's in balance i hope to to not have huge weed problems at the moment i don't um but that can always change everything you do on the farm every time you grow a crop i suppose you're 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 altering the soil or you're manipulating the soil so um, you just don't know what's in the future for you. I, I would go, if I had to go mechanically weeding, maybe I, maybe I will, but uh, the focus is on soil health. And if the soil is functioning and the microbes are, and the biology is functioning, I'm hoping that I won't end up with any weed out of balance. So um, seeing weeds as sent in to correct problems. So a problem that I potentially could create, you could end up with an oversupply of a certain weed and then you'll have to look at why it's there and try and rectify it. Okay, so even when you were converting, you didn't see like suddenly a uh, dock turning up massively or do you know what I mean? In the first few years, did you, there was did you see support. your yield change and stuff like that as well? Yield change, but it wasn't like it wasn't a complete crash um, and weeds did turn up, but you'd, you'd find some weeds would come and go. Um, there was a field of variable silage I put in and I had a lot of thistles in that the first year. Um, I topped them before they went to, uh, or it was cut before they went to seed uh, in the second year. Second year they turned up after the herbicide was the first year and the second year these thistles turned up. But um, they, they just, they kind of, they passed on. It, the, the soil moved on and the farm moved on and, and they, they sort of left. So I suppose it was a, it was there for a reason, but the, the reason kind of rectified itself. Um, so the, it, it it's only when something persists or is uh, that you've sort of made, need to make correction, corrections, I suppose. So. 
So you're saying you produce organic oats. Is there a big demand for them or? There was. It's, it's sort of reaching a level now where there's there's a good few more farmers coming into our organic tillage and the uh, the organic oats would be an easy one because they want to grow. They have an allopathic effect on weeds around them. They're quite vigorous in their growth and, you know, it's it's it's, it's a plant that just wants to grow and, and grows well in our organic system. So people tend to grow it a good bit. And um, so it's, it's under a bit of pressure for the minute. So they'd have to increase markets. There's a quota system at the moment. Um, I was lucky the first year I got in. Uh, the second year they came up with the quota. So uh, I got the quota because I'd already supplied. So that whoever supplied them, they said that you had a quota and they weren't, they weren't accepting any new um, people. So I don't know what way that would go. Who do you buy- sell your roots to? Or? It goes to Flavins. Flavins, so, okay. Um, there's a buyer in the north, the new one, um, Whites. And I don't know, Glamby do buy some as well. So there's still a few buyers out there. And you'd be hopeful that there'll be enough buyers for the, for the supply. So. We were speaking to another farmer uh, before, and I thought they had said that Flavins had so much demand. Maybe this was more during COVID, or I don't know, but they had so much demand that they actually couldn't keep up with the Irish farmers and they had to import organic oats. For the... they were, I think they were always importing, but it's like anything, uh, it's there's demand until there's oversupply, and then all of a sudden you kind of, mm. you find out what the real demand is. Um, uh, so, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's getting close to where it's it's reaching that point so i don't know it'll i suppose next couple of years will tell people's buying habits and customer sentiment and the, them with their advertising and marketing they'll have to if they have uh, potential to increase their if there's potential to increase it they should i suppose and they probably will and your pea and uh, barley combo goes for animal feed is it or organic it does, animal yeah, feed, yeah. organic um, organic dairy farmers buy that so um it seems to go quite well um the pea and the barley grow great together it's it's been a it was uh it was an interesting one to see it was uh, it was it was kind of a bit of a leap of faith because I, I wasn't sure what i was doing when i grew it first um the only thing that gave me a bit of confidence was the fact that you knew other people were growing it mm. uh, it had worked on other farms so but um you harvest that together and um, the combine takes it in you set the combine for the pea and it gathers up the pea and the barley it's grown the pea seems to just really like it here i'm really happy with it it's, um, it's quite cheery plant like um there's lovely flower on it at the moment and it looks great mm. in the field Um, it's a legume as well so it's 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 pulling in a bit of nitrogen and yeah it's a bit of diversity then two plants not not growing a monocrop um i prefer to be growing two two in the same field together and it seems to suit, suit the farm here it's been going well over the last couple of years it's my second or third year out now so mm. and like <clears throat> when i speak to other tillage farmers sometimes they say they can't take that extra step to organic because they need to spray pre-harvest. <clears throat> yeah. What do you, you, you obviously don't have those kind of chemical inputs pre-harvest. No. So um, well, you, is your yield different? Or what's, what do you say well, to the those farmers? Different. Like you're looking at uh, the pea barley crop seems to be comfortable at around 1.75 to maybe 1.8 or 9 ton uh, consistent. Um, spring oats are in around the same uh and close to two ton about two ton an acre you'd get out of your spring oats and um, so it's not yielding as much but then your margin is totally different and your management is different you're not out the whole time spraying it mm. um and it is um it's um yeah like harvest could be difficult if you ended up with a very green crop like you're you're reliant on if there's a lot of grass in the in the bottom of it, like it, the days close up very quick. Like, and if you think of people that are on big acres, like if you had a an eight hundred acre farm or a thousand acres of of land to get through, if your days start short and up, you're in trouble. But I suppose a lot of our a lot of the organic farms are probably not at that scale. So, like I've um I've got hundred acres of tillage here, so I'm not having those problems necessarily. But you can run into problems, and I suppose modern farming has worked to the scale. So. There is a reason for it as well. Um, like the sprays will keep the crop cleaner, so then you're able to get going earlier in the morning. Your combine doesn't uh, start grumbling at night, um, and it is a bit of a race with organic crops. I'm only, I'm only two or three years, or three or four years into it, but um, when the crop starts dying back, that's when the grass and the weeds sort of come at you because they're still growing. Your crops finish growing, and there is a kind of a fine window there of time to harvest, and it can, in a wet time, it could be. Could be nervy enough, so it's it's, so it's not uh not necessarily easy or straightforward. So there is, 
there's a reason why people would be apprehensive about moving into into organic tillage. Um, it takes a bit of planning and thinking, and you'd want to sort of know what you're at with it. Mm. And <clears throat> you use cover crops um, to encourage pollinators and stuff. Which ones do you use, or how's that worked for you? And um, we saw. We've sown some, some cover crops. I think the problem with the cover crops for me here at the moment is I moved to spring cropping when I went to organic and you're looking at sowing in, say, late August, or early September, and it, it's late for getting it and really going. So uh, Ryan Vetch seemed to work quite well here at that time of year. So I found that if you, if you were buying too many different things or stuff that didn't want to be grown at that time of year, you were sort of wasting your money. So... Um, <clears throat> mainly it's a Ryan Vetch cover that we, we grow here um, and then I would try and put some stuff into the into the actual cash crops themselves so I do sprinkle sunflower seeds into the into the mix as I'm sowing my corn uh, sometimes I put linseed into it and um, stuff like that and I've been putting clovers in as well into the base of the, the crop so sometimes I go out with the quad afterwards and I'll, I'll broadcast a uh, clovers into the crop and it will help um i suppose it takes a bit of space it gives a like you have crimson clover there and stuff like that it, 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 it works in well with your crop and you're sort of selecting then what you have in your field and yeah so it, it's it, that's mainly what i'd be doing if i was putting something in maybe we might go in with the crop as long as it wasn't going to interfere with the with the harvest or with the with the cash crop yeah so sorry if this is obvious to the listeners but so when you're harvesting the clover just stays in the understory yeah it would do yeah, the, yeah. The, so now i was only kind of dabbling with it because i didn't want, <laughs> didn't want to end up with a i couldn't cut my crop so i sort of just was dabbling with it so i put it into a couple of headlands and kind of but it it, it, it didn't grow too tall like so you, you like i'd be chopping all my straw here as well so um it you can keep the combine up as long as the crop keeps standing your combine's up a bit and you're, you're sort of just skimming the top but like it's the heads is mainly what i'm after so Mm, fair enough and uh you compost your own farm manure what's your process for doing this or um well you'd uh, the composting process so i would i don't really want to be putting out raw farming manure so i would feel that if you um if you compost it properly it, it's a, it's a more um it's more stable for the to grow less weeds and be more uh, ready to go for the plant in the soil so we would take out the we take the compost and we would add a bit of soil to it. Uh, I usually put a bit of sand with it. Uh, and then if I had basalt rock dust, I'd put that in as well. And then I'd turn it. So you'd be trying to get it up in small windrows is what I usually do. So I usually turn it with the tractor, put it in long windrows and uh, <clears throat> try and make sure everything's mixed up. Try and get the moisture right in the pile and then do about two or three turnings and then leave it. I usually spread it in the autumn. So if I can gather it up there in sort of, February, March, and April time, and then put it in the corner of a field. So I, I pick a site before the plow goes in or whatever, I'll tip it out in the field and then I'll sort of roll it over itself into the, so if I tip it near where I want it to finish up, I might roll it over itself two or three times, mm-hmm. try and keep plenty of air and try and get it to calm down. And then <clears throat> that would be, uh, that would be what I do with the compost. So. so you'd use the same year, you wouldn't like leave it a year or two, you use it that kind of same year? You're not really you're not allowed to leave it out for, for oh, yeah. years, so it'll have to be spread by the you're allowed um store it on the land but it'll have to be spread uh, by, the, by the end of the spreading window so, okay fair enough and what hit or herbal lays do you use um so i would have um clovers i would have some oh, what are you putting in uh clovers chicory plantain and then different types of grasses so yeah that's uh it, it, i suppose the clover is the real one it, it seems just it just grows away and it, 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 it's, it flies for the sheep with white clover really i'd be kind of having on the farm here it, it just it, it seems to suit it and it, it grows away and it's, it's running a little bit out of steam here at the moment i have one that's in four years and i think that's that needs to be kind of freshened up now so mm-hmm. but that's a good, good old run of things i can we have to try and figure out the rotations properly with the with the tillage ground and with the clovers and, and start moving things around now. So, okay. Um, uh, I read that you're kind of guided by biodynamic principles. I mean, do you want to explain that? What that is? How, how it's kind of influenced your farm? And is it just something you came into when you kind of changing over to biodynamic? Uh, sorry, organic. Um, well, I suppose you're looking at um, 
enhancing the soil and soil function, like that is the most important thing to me is to get the soil functioning properly. So you're looking at ways to do that. And uh, my brother's been, um, he's been organic 20 years and, you know, I saw him and he was kind of muddling around with the organics and it was going fine, but he, he got into the biodynamics there, uh, say the last uh, six or seven years. And I really I noticed the difference in his farm and what he was doing and I kind of got interested in it there. So it definitely would be something I've seen him at and having success with. So um, that's that's where it's coming from here. So uh, I'm trying to learn it off him and to, he's he's after buying machines to to stir and to spread the, the preparations. And I think it, it should make a big difference here just to, to how the farm the farm functions so um i suppose back when you go back to when i was conventional i was looking at you know a field or a crop whereas now i kind of focus on the farm as a whole entity and that i need to look after it like that so growing your hedges out um just having a really healthy vibrant farm and trying these these preparations to help me uh me get that into the soil and you know uh, get the soil functioning and that, that's Sort of what, what do you buy the preparations so do you make them on site or trevor started making them on his farm now yeah but um he's been buying them in from france as well from a, from a guy called vincent masson so um i suppose it's 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 a good way to get started at it to buy them in at least you know if they're right and they're they're done right so um yeah so you can either make them or get them in but if you were starting out you'd be, you'd be buying them in to get a, get a taste of it and see if it it did anything for your farm so I just have one more question about tillage before I move on to the sheep a bit more. Um, <clears throat> and if anyone has any questions, do type them into the chat box. Uh, but have you seen in the few years that you have been organic or that you have been focusing a bit more on, on your soils and stuff, have you seen a massive difference in your soils? Have you been kind of uh, analysing them or uh, looking at them or have they changed or do you just get the feeling from what you're seeing productive wise that they are changing? I'm a bit of both. So... Yeah, I feel that the soil is moving in the right direction here. Yeah, um, it is a bit of a mix in the farm. Like some of the ground has been under grassland for longer and then some of the ground is in and tillage for longer. So there is a mix between the fields. So yeah, I, I, I definitely think it's helped. I think the soil, soil is a bit freer and easier to till. I think the fertilizers are hardening the soil up. So I would feel my soil has um, improved since I stopped with the fertilizer um, and I suppose in regards to, to testing or analysing anything, um, I'm involved with an EIP uh, with Danu and they're doing trials in the farm here at the moment. So we've uh, we four test plots picked out and we're doing different amendments on them. Um, it was to come up with a biological transition programme and um, a transition from conventional farming to, to, um, to biological farming. So I suppose I kind of stepped outside that. I suppose it was probably the... The fact that I got interested in the organic side moved completely. So um, the rest, there's a good few of the farmers are, are, the majority of the farmers are conventional farmers. They're looking for, to build a program to transition into biological farming and what kind of improvements you can make in a conventional farm. So we're doing <clears throat> soil samples and um, tissue testing, and we're trying to keep track of, of what works. So that's something I'm involved in as well. So, And you, it, it, have you kind of got results from that or that's not kind of, ready yet yeah, we're starting to get that to, that to that stage now so um just being i suppose it's a, good, it's a big learning curve you're getting farmers together and you're trying to like it is field-based trials so it can be very difficult because you're you're working off a fairly limited budget and you're trying to find your way as a group to find stuff out but yeah no the, the i think the tissue testing is definitely um starting to show results now i i, don't, I haven't really met up with the, the conventional lads to see what they're seeing yet but uh, i think it will definitely be interesting when we start pulling it all together i think it'll be very interesting so so is that a five-year thing or it's a five-year thing yeah, yeah five-year so. thing okay um just before we kind of move across to the sheet um feel free to anyone to kind of write questions as much as you want but i'll just kind of take a couple there now while we're here james ham uh thanks very much for the info graham how do you deal with the cover crop ahead of tilling in the spring well my sheep would graze it so uh i'd graze everything um, the sheep would run over the tillage ground in the winter. It takes a bit of pressure off the grass and it would mean that I'd be able to sort of hold up a bit of grass then for spring. So everything, all the tillage ground would be grazed and then ploughed as well. So I am on, it's, on, it's a play-based system as well. So, so it would be grazed and then ploughed. Okay, David Russell asks, it's a very interesting talk so far. Just wondering, do you lime your land? 
I have done yet in the past. I haven't done it in a while. So um, it's it, I needed to or. Um, just... I don't think it needs it at the moment anyway, so it seems to be okay. So I suppose there, there is soil samples being taken and I just keep an eye on it, but uh, um, it's, it, it's in the right spot at the moment for me. So we see how the soil, how the microbes and the biology can keep that right, because obviously as I keep taking off, um, things could change if, if that doesn't, but we see what they can access and just keep an eye on the soil test and see, keep an eye on the crops as well, but the crops are the most important thing. If the crops are healthy and growing, um, that's that's my main focus of, you know, um, I'm not sure about getting too caught up with, with the, the soil tests or an indicator, but maybe not the be all and the end all. Mm. Okay. And as someone said, like you can take a soil test, but 10 meters away, it could be different anyway. So, you it's know. It's a snapshot in time of a, yeah. of a field at that time of day and um, mm. in that that time. And as you sow different plants, they influence the soil and they, um, they react to the plants that are in, in the soil. So I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an indicator. It's a, yeah. it's a useful indicator, but... Um, you have to take a big picture look at it. So. Mm. Yeah, maybe when you're starting out, it's no harm to do one, but like Definitely, yeah. not to be kind of tied to it every year, like you say. Yeah. So you've specifically chosen Belle, Claire and Charlie used to work with. Is there a reason why or? Uh, well, that'll be the Rams I, I selected. Um, okay. The Belle, Claire is bred white-faced sheep. And it seems to go quite well in the organic system. It, 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 basing this uh, on what Trevor told me first of all. So Trevor had the Bell Claire and he felt that they were cleaner and uh, quite prolific as well. So I went with that and I was happy with it. So um, the shower lays are in there as well. It's just, I suppose, just to keep a bit of uh, something else coming in. I don't want them to get too pure and I, you, they're, they're good terminal sire as well. So um, we're lambing them down around the 1st of March. Um, since I've gone organic, uh, the elves actually haven't been dosed at all. They've never received any dose. Um, the grazing I do on a rotational basis, so I move them and uh, I have electric pa uh, fence paddocks. And so I try to keep them moving and like onto fresh ground. And I would be grazing longer pastures now as well. So I don't really graze the, graze the grass out real tight. I try and let it uh, recover or I, I leave more behind than I ever did. So if you graze the grass, I'm, this is why I did a holistic grazing course and they were saying that if you graze the grass too tight you've it has to kill off part of its roots system to survive and then it has to regrow the roots to regrow the, the the grass so the theory being that if i leave it longer it doesn't have to kill off those roots it has a, a, a more developed root ball to grow the grass back so so that's what we're at here um so i suppose for grazing it a bit longer as well it has the benefit of maybe not being quite as um much of a worm burden because they're not uh, grazing down low so yeah, the lambs, the lambs try very well. Uh, they seem to get up and thrive and uh, get going very quick now on the way. The so way do you let you lamb outside, obviously? No, they lamb in the shed and then go away. So what I'm saying actually. is okay. that they seem to finish up quite quickly the way I'm doing it. With that rotational grazing system, they're going onto fresh grass a lot of the time and the grass gets a chance to recover. It's about the recovery days, not about the days grazing. So because you're, you've tightened them up into smaller space, so I have um, I have between six and eight paddocks that I, put, I, I moved them across. And it, it means that the one that they've taken off it then has a chance to recover. It doesn't, whereas if you have the one big, big open field, say they're, they're, they're grazing all of it all the time and it never gets a chance to recover. So it's the recovery days that seem to really drive the growth. And then the fact that they're moving on as well helps with the worm burdens. So the, mm. the lambs, um, like we started, what is it now? Um, I, I started lambing on the 1st of March. I have 60 lambs gone already now this year. So okay. they, they finish up quite quick now. Okay, yeah, that's really well. good. That's with no either, so. Yeah. And um, so how many to the acre as such? Um, there's 130 yos running across. Uh, they're on about 35 acres, but there is more grassland there. Um, they're on about 35 acres there at the moment. So. 14 acres. Yeah um okay cool and uh, so just to clarify when you're opening up your electric fence throughout your paddock in the kind of the rotational grazing are you closing up behind them as well or are you letting them they move yeah they they, they don't get to go back to where they grazed yeah. so okay um yeah so uh, i see a question there in about the grass getting stemmy so i suppose it's the clover mix and there's other plants like i i do notice the they don't seem to that, that worried. Now, it did get a bit stemmy this year. It doesn't seem to affect it any thrive with the sheep. 
I noticed that they, um, I turned them into a field there about three weeks ago and had really strong docks in it. Like um, the stems of the docks would be like a biro, like they'd be that thick and hard. And they actually grazed them down to the, the butt. They butted, they went, left the grass in the field and butted the, all, the th all the docks in the field. They mm. wiped them out. And I suppose it just goes to show that a, an animal will find um, these, these, these plants are kind of mining stuff from deep down that a, like a, a perennial ryegrass wouldn't be able to get. Mm. So whatever the dock had that they wanted, they, they sensed it was there and they went and they got it. So um, like stemmy grass or longer grass is going to have a deeper root that's accessing stuff deeper down as well. And they, you see them nibbling off the seed heads and going after things you wouldn't, you wouldn't um, expect. So um, it's, it's possibly it's something that's a bit odd or uh, counterintuitive to what we've been taught, but it seems to be working and I'm, I'm kind of getting a bit more comfortable with it as the more I do it. So. Mm, interesting. I think in docks, in, uh, in humans, it's supposed to kind of help with circulation and stuff. So yeah. maybe it was uh, something to do with that, but I don't know for them. Um, mm. the, uh, so when you changed over to organic with your sheep, um, did you have to re reduce numbers because you couldn't, maybe no. your grass wasn't growing as fast or any of that? Or No, I was a bit concerned about that, but uh, I backed off a bit on the tillage the first year. Um, uh, I put in, I put one of the fields down to our arable silage, like I said, and then it was going into the grazing rotation afterwards. But I, I, I didn't need it, so I put it back into tillage afterwards. I'm back, so I went down to 2018 or 20 acres of tillage, but I went back up then two years later because I just I wasn't sure what I was getting into. Um, <clears throat> by having, I suppose if I tried to go in off of the back of um, say old lays, I'm not sure whether that would have worked. The two of the tillage fields got rotated into the clover um, lays with the chicory and the plantain, and the, just the power and the energy of that of that growth was just incredible. Like um, and that really carried the farm. So I'm not sure what I would like to be doing it with uh, the reseeds. So mm. um, there just seems to be difficult. Clover would surprise you. Like it, it just leaves me to wonder why the hell I was spreading fertilizer all those years, just wasting money. So because I've the same amount of sheep on the same ground now. And I'm probably going to go up in numbers next year. I'm going to push it up a little bit. So, yeah. Sorry if this is a really obvious question because I, I just don't know the answer myself. Um, when you changed to organic, did your sheep, did you keep the same families of sheep? Were you able, did they convert to organic with you or did you have to cut them no. and buy no, organic? They, still, they converted. Yeah, they, they come with you, but they're never organic. So, uh, only stock that's born organic can be organic. They don't ever get certified. but. I could still sell the, an organic lamb out of a conventional yo once she's been on my farm for that period of time. So whatever yo's were there, when I started the, the process, they'll obviously every year they get more organic because I'm keeping my own replacements. So I don't buy in any replacements. So I suppose that was another change as well. I would have been buying 30 to 50 or, or whatever, you know, every couple of years I'd have to refresh the flock up and I would have been buying hoggets. Uh, whereas now I keep replacements every year. It's my own stock. They're tuned into my own land. I'm not bringing any worm burdens in, so I'm not complicating my life there either. So the only thing that comes in is a ram. Mm. I don't buy anything in. Um, so you're breeding your own replacements and you can just sort of really, you know, tune into what what you want. So you select them, you're kind of watching the lambs. And I, whenever I am whenever I bring the sheep in, to select, um, I'm drafting for a sale. I'll have a can in my hand for marking your lambs and I'll be watching them. I'll see one I like, she gets a mark. And when she has that mark, she's, she's safe till later okay. on the year. I won't touch her. Yeah. It's a real kind of line in the sand that that one's... Uh, She's a goodie. Yeah, so yeah. So um, so keeping the replacements, I think, is a huge, huge help to the... So to do you the, have to find a different organic ram every time or you can just find any ram? You can buy conventional rams, yeah. So. Okay, okay. Yeah, purebreds. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Oh, yeah, okay. Fair enough. Um, so you produce organic spring lamb. Do you, is there a huge demand for this? Um, well, I was quite lucky with that. Um, when I, the first year that I was fully organic certified, um, we were going into lockdown and everyone was at home. I think they were buying expensive cuts of meat. And when I rang, I'd been told it was quite difficult to get organic lamb away. The, I was talking to the guy that was uh, buying and he said his market had gone up 300%. So it was a huge increase. And uh, the first year, I think all of our 20 or 30 went um you know, about 150 went organic, which was great. Mm. Um, and I don't know, you just never know what's coming down the line. 
the world's kind of very uncertain at the moment. You people's buying patterns are changing, and money's getting scarce, so you just don't know what way that's going to twist or turn. But I suppose the one thing is that you're <clears throat> you're not got a huge spend, you're not looking to pay huge merchant bills, and I just wouldn't be nearly as exposed as I was before. Like um, the farm would have been, I would have been borrowing a good amount every year, whereas this year I didn't use any of my um, overdraft, so I'm on. Uh, I'm on just on money from cash flow. So, whereas before, you could have had thirty or fifty thousand out of the bank when I was when I was conventional, and you'd be coming around to harvest time, and it'd have to go well. Like otherwise, because you had to gather all that money back up. Like so, whereas now mm, the farm's able to carry itself. Hold itself. Yeah. Okay. Mm, it's much more uh, viable. Like, <laughs> do you sell direct to market with your? Um, no. You do, would you consider that at all, or is you don't think that's it's kind of? Yeah, I would do. Yeah, it'd be nice to see. Uh, to make that connection but i suppose it's going to be extra work and certainly with where the price went in the last uh say 12 months or 24 months lamb is very high like you know and it, it'd be very ad- hard to add any anything to that and um, i can load 30 into a trailer and go straight down and you know as opposed to running around with with small amounts like so um i don't know mm. have to see. Where, where does your lamb end up in kind of mainstream supermarkets is it or I suppose so. Yeah, it's good herdsman. So uh, yeah, you'd see it. Uh, I presume that's where it is. So some of it went for organic baby food for German for Germany. For uh, they have a contract to supply uh, meat to them. So oh, okay, yeah, interesting. So you produce your own hay silage and straw, and I suppose that kind of cuts down your external inputs as well. Yeah. Or, like, or how do you, how do you feel this kind of self sustaining model works for you? Well, that, I think that's exactly it. It is very self-sustaining. Like I don't really need to buy in a lot of stuff. So, um, whereas before I would have been selling hay and silage, I don't really need that income anymore. And I would see it as being detrimental to the soil and to the farm if I was taking too much off it. So the only thing that really, the only thing that leaves is grain uh, and meat, so the lamb. So, um, <clears throat> and then bringing stuff back in, I'm not... I'm not buying in, in lambs anymore or, or hoggets as replacements. Um, I, you know, it, it just, it's, it's just a simple, a kind of simple and, and uh, easy to manage system. Like, and I do buy in, uh, obviously the organic seed, I think is very important to the system. It, it, it just, it seems to just as well with the, with the, with the system. So it's, it's great to have good quality seed and get it in the ground and get it away. Like, so. Mm. Interesting. So you've kind of mentioned like this is the first year since turning organic that you kind of feel maybe financially it's starting to kind of break even a bit and you're able to breathe. Do you also feel that it's a different place to work, like a better place? Or I mean, I'm not putting words into your mouth. Sorry. Oh, no, is totally, it a different place to work? Totally is, but that was part of what I wanted. Like, um, like this is my home. This is where my family are. And I would have been going before, like, and maybe I'd done a pass or two with the sprayer. And it'd be a sunny evening and he'd say, oh, we go for a walk. And you'd be there thinking, well, I better not go in there because like, you know, there's residues all over it. Like, so I don't really want my kids walking through. Maybe they put something in their mouth or they're brushing through it. Whereas now there's nowhere really I can't go. And like, if I was up to, say it was springtime and I was, um, I was putting the seed in the cedar and the cedar around the shed, it, it would have had dressing on it. Like uh, I, I small children and don't touch that. You can't touch that. Don't put that in your mouth. Oh, go wash your hands. Whereas now there's just not, not that same kind of toxicity, toxicity around the farm, mm. which is a huge plus. There's not as many dangerous things around and it's just a, it's a nicer place. And like, you know, you, you have more things growing, like whereas I would have been cutting hedges tight and um, you'd have been, if you'd have seen, you know, uh, weeds or plants in your, in your hedge, you'd be there thinking, well, I better get rid of them. And you know, whereas now stuff's kind of blooming and flowering and there's, there's butterflies and there's birds and you know it just just it's, it's a happier place for everyone really mm-hmm. like it's a, it's a better place for my family it's a better place for nature like you know um and that's what you want when you get when you finish up work it's 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 a nice place to go walk and you know you, you feel happy out there so Interesting, yeah. <clears throat> are there any species in particular that you've noticed kind of responding to your methods of farming and uh, I suppose I won't be very good at identifying the bird species, but since we lost small birds around, um, like uh, yeah, you just notice the, the the chirping and the, the and I suppose butterflies as well. There's a certain amount of butterflies around that I would like. I, said, I wouldn't be good at identifying them, but you you sort of enjoy seeing them all around the place. And 
you, whether it's just a state of mind because you're noticing things more, but you'd feel like there's more around, it, it's hard to know which, which it is, whether you notice it more or there's, there's more there. So like, you know, you, you start paying more attention to things and paying more attention to what plants grow on the farm, be they a, a, a weed or, a, or, a, or a, a plant, you know what I mean? You'd, you'd just be noticing stuff more and it's more tuned into things. So yeah. um, it's definitely <clears throat> Great. Um, have, if anyone has any questions, please um, do put them forward. Uh, David Russell has asked, what, "What do you do any hedgerow management? I haven't cut any hedges since I went in. Um, I, was, I was actually surprised how little they grew. It, 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 it's taken them a while to kind of get themselves going again. So um, I definitely wouldn't go, like I I wouldn't go cutting them nearly as hard as I, 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 I would have. Um, I'm not saying I wouldn't trim them back, like as in breast them. Back a little bit and put a bit of shape on them but I, I think i'll be leaving them alone for the minute um it's funny how like your your mindset changes like i was very happy with the hedges i remember the saw came in and we cut these hedges down and boxed them off and i started thinking wow the place looks great you can look look out and i could see across all these fields i could see from a farmyard all the way up and i was there oh wow this looks great like so i was delighted with myself mm -hmm. and uh then like i said i started thinking about things differently and like to be honest with you now, I'm quite horrified when I drive around and I see these hedges uh, stumped uh, every year. It's just like, oh God, it, it, it looks terrible. And it, it, it's still the same person looking at it with the same set of eyes, but I just see it completely different. Yeah, it's uh, amazing. Hmm. It, how you change that. Um, where would you start advising another farmer if they kind of wanted to start like <clears throat> making that conversion or making changes to their farm? What, what would you say to a farmer who comes along to you and says, "Well, I suppose there it is. It's it, it's the hedges is the is the first one is to kind of let life uh, uh, grow and express itself a bit. So I suppose the the hedges of any farm is an easy win for for a farm. Like um, I don't feel I'm sacrificing that much by letting them grow, and it gives gives nature a place to live. So, um, yeah, that that that'd be the, the the number one or the first change you could make. And after that, I suppose with grasslands is getting more plants growing in the grassland and letting it. Um, um, different rooting depths and stuff like that. Like, it's very easy. There's a couple of very easy wins there for you if you wanted to do stuff like that. So, um, different plants, different rooting depths, and um, the hedges that, that, that would be two good places to start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, it was interesting when you said that you used to walk around with your father and you were looking kind of at his big hedgerows and think, God, they take up so much space. Like, now that you're kind of a bit more pro hedgerow, would you kind of look back at that kind of 20 year old or whatever it was mm. um like do you need that land like did it i don't need it now no i, yeah, I would say don't. that is detrimental to the to the farm um and to how i'm going to produce things like so uh yeah i, I suppose i see it as con going, going going a bit of a, a roundabout way like i think he might have got it <laughs> i sort of missed the point and i thought yeah i can have that for me and there's a meter extra i can have there to sow and i'll get an extra ton of grain or whatever so um yeah it's it's interesting that i i, I don't feel i need that or, or i don't actually think it's any benefit to me so mm -hmm. i think that it'd be detrimental to what i want to do so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right enough. um is there anywhere in particular that you think farmers can go for advice and support if they want to kind of like where did you go for advice and support when you were looking to make changes apart from your brother yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but that's an interesting one in itself like a neighbor or another farmer you know well that's that... it but like with knots um uh, knots run a lot of farm walks there in the summer so going to farm walks um i joined base at, at one stage i was in base agriculture and you got to meet a lot of farmers there and go to a lot of farms i suppose far, farmer to farmer is really uh, is good learning especially like you can kind of get uh, go to talks and maybe uh, hear a lot, of, a lot of people speak but sometimes they're speaking about stuff that's not relevant to ireland so if you go to farms in ireland it's irish farmers making things work here and you can really kind of get yourself further down the line because um if you've got a farmer that's been practicing something for five or ten years and you get to talk to him it maybe saves you time learning something and uh so i suppose going to things like the 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 national uh, knots and they do the bio farm every year and uh, you'll get international speakers coming to that um, then reading some books uh whatever you're interested in if you're interested in your soil life or what type of plants to put into your farm and then getting getting to talk to other farmers like there's plenty of walks out there now that um 
that are, are good and it, it, literally talking to people is probably the biggest one so find out what works in their farm and kind of thinking about your own farm it, i don't think it's a good idea to copy anyone exactly or to, to say oh well i'm going to do this exactly you pull little bits from everyone and you kind of come up with a system for your own farm and i think it has to be tailored to each farm yeah it's interesting because i suppose like even wherever your farm is your neighbor's farm is actually different because it could be a different farming system no, different, totally, yeah. like, it has a different history as well like yeah. different history and you know even the way it faces or you know there's like you say by going to lots of different farms and talking to farmers about what works and what doesn't work is uh, is really good and i think the thing about kind of <clears throat> farming people who do biological farming or farming for nature it's not actually a competitive area. It's not like you're mm. competing with each other for yields mm. or competing for, you know, you might be competing for the rarest butterfly, maybe, but like, but it's so it's, a, I would say it's kind of quite an engaging. Find it, I find it very positive. Yeah. I find yeah. the people very positive and helpful. And they really want to, if you ask them a question, you sort of got, you got a real genuine, straightforward answer. And they were kind of, there's nearly an excitement or a, yeah, there was a bit of passion there about what they were doing, and it was it was, it was good and positive. A lot of these these talks, and it was kind of energizing to go to them. Um, mm. and, you know, you can bring that home. Yeah. yeah so, Biofarm. If anyone missed that, that's the biological mm. farming conference every year, which is generally around the Port Leash area each November, mm. I think. And then he um, does a series of farm walks in the summer. I think he's about halfway through. So there's like seven or ten walks on relevant farms, and there'll be always something close to you. So like, it, it's not as if you have to go too far because it, it moves around the country. Like so. Yeah. Yeah, I, be good and there's well. about 20 farming for nature walks as well oh yeah well there you go yeah, yeah. So there is <laughs> tell me graham uh, we're about to finish up but um is there one memory that stands out for you that your farm was working you, you realized that your farm was actually working alongside nature it's working for you it's i suppose it's probably the the observation and you, you kind of appreciate it more like you're walking the fields and you you know that nature's growing this stuff you're not forcing it like so you're not you know it's, it's chemically driven like you were kind of you were just kind of throwing a lot of stuff at it to get the crops whereas now you're sort of it's a, it's a bit more subtly you're you're relying on the soil and you're working with nature there like if you think about it, if you abuse that soil it's going to crash and it's going to leave you high and dry whereas if you work with it it should take you a long way and it's it's something to be minded and treasured though like um yeah that'd be the big thing for me is the, the, the appreciation of what the farm's doing for me and, and how I need to look after it. And it's kind of nice. Uh, I think you said you had children or something that you're kind of creating a legacy going forward as well for future generations, whether it be for them or for, you know, some other farmer. Yeah, whoever comes along. Yeah. yeah. Whatever comes along. Exactly. Listen, Graham, thanks a million. Thanks for joining us tonight. That was really no problem, inspiring. Pleasure. It's really interesting and to learn again so much new stuff about different area a different area of farming and um, if anyone missed uh, any of, of tonight or would like to listen to the whole thing again it will be up on our youtube channel tomorrow so feel free to share it with anyone and um, we have our last q a session in two tuesdays time with mona muller who is a mixed up farmer in county clare so do join us for that just register as normal and <clears throat> if you have any questions about farming alongside nature we have a forum online which you can pop up a question and farmers will answer your question for you. Um, so our farmers are our ambassadors. Uh, meanwhile, uh, we do have the Farming for Nature walk, so feel free to look them up on our website and do join us on all the usual kind of social uh, media platforms if you're on them. Graham, thanks a million again and no uh, great job and very inspiring and great to chat to you. So thanks for that. Uh, we'll see you again soon. And thanks to everyone else for joining us as well.